I'm speaking today on uh, a subject that I have titled, Lead Me, Lord. Lead me, Lord. Everybody say that together with me. Oh, are you here for greater works? Why are you talking as if you are here for lesser works? Let's speak like we are here for greater works. Say, lead me, Lord. Ah, that sounds better. That sounds better. Now, if, if there is any factor that I can point to, or if, if, if I'm supposed to just give you one factor, and, and there is no longer, there's not only one factor, there are many factors that create something. But if you say single, the most important factor in your life, that has helped you in your Christian walk to be where you are, this is the factor, is the ability to follow God, to follow his leading, to hear from God, to, to know that as a Christian, God is guiding you. Um, because everybody has to make decisions. Everybody. You're making decisions all the time. For yourself, for your children, for your partners, for your business, for your co-workers. We're always making decisions. And the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your decisions. If your life is not doing well, it means your decisions are not doing well. You're not making good choices. You're not making good decisions. And no human being can make good decisions 100% of the time. But we should desire that our decisions are as accurate as possible. And one of the ways to do that is to be led by God. Every leader needs to be led. He must learn to follow God's leading. So I'm going to start by reading a few passages from the Bible and then I will do my teaching. Psalm 5 verse 8 Psalm 5 verse 8 says, Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. Psalm 25, <clears throat> Psalm 25 verse 5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Psalm 27, verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Psalm 61, verse 1 and 2. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. All these are Psalms of David. When you study the Psalms, you find this theme throughout the Psalms. Lead me, Lord. Lead me, Lord. Guide me, Lord. Show me the way. Teach me your way. Constantly, throughout the Psalms, the prayers of David is for God to lead him. If we, are, we want to find the secret of David's success, it was the leading of God. If you want to know the secret to your own success, it is going to be the leading of God. The extent to which you are sensitive to God's leading will determine the extent of your success. Your success factor, it's a critical success factor for you to make the right choice. And the way to do that is to be led by God. So David had a great desire to be led by God. One of my favorite hymns was penned by Samuel Wesley, a grandson of Charles Wesley. And uh, as you know, Charles Wesley uh, and his brother John founded the Methodist Church. And their grandson, uh, Samuel, also a songwriter, and the Wesleys were good songwriters. He penned the words of this hymn. Most of you may be familiar with it. 
It says, lead me, Lord, lead me in thy righteousness. Make thy way plain before my face. For it is thou, Lord, thou, Lord only, that makest me dwell in safety. It's a prayer for God to lead us. Every leader must learn to be led by God. As a leader, David was a great warrior. He was a great fighter. He could beat big people, tall people, giants, pull them down. But we're going to find very soon that almost every time when David was going into a battle, he had to seek God's leading. He was skilled, he was talented, but he had to be sure that every decision he was making was the right decision. So let's see generally the pattern that God uses to lead us, the pattern. And the pattern, I'm going to pick it from the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 to 22. Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 to 22. Now, this is talking about when the children of Israel left Egypt, going into the promised land. So, they're going into the promised land, a land they have never seen before. And this is how God was going to take them there. Exodus chapter 13, verse 21 to 22. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that by day and by night he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now I want you to note the phrase, the Lord went before them. Now that phrase means that God went ahead of them. He did not just go with them. He did not just uh, follow them and, and guide them from behind. But he went before them. He went ahead of them. And the, the passage did not say a cloud went before them. It says the Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud and in a pillar of fire. So really when they saw that pillar of cloud and the, uh, and the pillar of fire, they were not just looking at cloud and fire. They were looking at the Lord because the Lord went before them in the pillar of cloud in the pillar of fire it's very important that when we are following a sign we remember we are not following the sign we are following the lord because sometimes we forget and put our confidence in a sign rather than in the lord the lord went before them in a pillar of fire by day uh, by night and a pillar of cloud by day now, if you look at this passage, God was leading them on, in two ways. By day and by night. Everybody say, by day and by night. Now, how did he lead them by day? He led them by day through a pillar of cloud. A pillar of cloud. In the night, he led them through a pillar of fire. Now, why did he lead them through a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of cloud uh, fire by night? The daytime represents the time when you see clearly. When it's daytime, you don't not normally put on light. I know in Britain, sometimes when it's daytime, it's dark because you have the craziest weather pattern in the whole world. So, very moody uh, uh, weather but all things being equal in the daytime you don't turn on the light because in the daytime you see clearly in the daytime everything is clear i mean in the daytime 
uh, when there is a football match, they're, they're going to turn on floodlights in the daytime. It doesn't make sense because everything is clear. So God says, when everything is clear, I will lead you by the cloud. Now, what does that mean? The cloud does not give light. The cloud only gives direction. So when God says, when everything is clear, you just do what I've told you to do. Now, what, what time is everything clear? When God has already given us his word or given us light on a situation, he will not give you more light. So, for example, there are some actions that are clearly spelled out in the Bible. Thou shalt not commit adultery. God has already given light to it. Now, you, when, when you, 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 you're going through life, you don't, you don't go and say, Lord, please lead me. Please, Lord. Holy Ghost, lead me. Should I commit adultery? Should I not? No. It's, it's daytime. Why? Because the word of God is clear. Thou shalt not steal. You don't pray about it. Just don't steal. Thou shalt not lie. You don't seek the Holy Ghost inspiration. You don't speak a prophetic word about should I lie or not lie. Thou shalt not lie. It's daytime. And all that God gives you is the pillar of cloud. Follow it. When I give you light already, follow and obey. Now, the problem with a lot of believers is that in the daytime, they want pillar of fire. In the daytime, when God says, don't do it, you know the word of God is clear. You have to read your Bible. You don't pray, God, should I read my Bible today or should I not? The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God. Pray without ceasing. You don't pray about whether you should pray. You don't pray about whether you should fast. I said, you don't pray about whether you should fast. I know some of you were praying about whether you should fast, and you prayed about it, and you didn't fast. Now you want greater works without fasting. Why? Jesus says, when you pray, not if you pray. When? It means you have to fast. You have to pray. You have to study your Bible. You don't have to commit adultery. You don't have to lie. You don't have to have any other God besides him. These matters are daylight. And you don't go to God for further instruction and clarity. So when it is day, when God's word is light, it's clear, what we do is we obey what we know God says. Even if it pinches our flesh, we obey God. All right. Then there is a night situation. The night situation is when you cannot see clearly. This is when you are in the dark. The will of God is not clearly known. This refers to instances in your life where there is no direct word of God. For example, you are going to marry. And you have seen two sisters. Sister A and Sister B. And they all seem to be nice girls. And they all seem to be marriageable. But you can't marry the two of them. You have to marry one. So you, there, there's no scripture verse you are going to go into the Bible and read and, and say, I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt marry Agnes. Or thou shalt marry Mary. Or thou shalt marry Theodora. No. Have you seen any such scripture? So, in such a situation, you are in the dark. You are in the dark. Or you're going to make a business decision. Should I invest? Should I not invest? Should I put 10,000 pounds into that investment? Or should I not? Should I buy a house? Should I not buy a house? You're not going to find a scripture verse that says, buy a house in this location. There's no scripture verse. So there's no light on it. You are in the dark. And when we encounter situations where there's no direct scriptural provision, God gives us the pillar of fire. Are you following me? 
So the pillar of fire is for the time when there is no clarity. The pillar of cloud is when there is clarity. Pillar of fire when there is no clarity. But if you watch what the Bible says about the children of Israel, it says by day and by night they were constantly moving. So when they knew what to do, they moved. When it was unclear, they still moved. So you're not going to say, well, this thing I want to do, I want to marry, I see Sister A, I see Sister B, I like both of them, they are all nice, they, they are all the same height, they, the same weight, they, they are in the same group, they are all in the choir, so now your choice is becoming difficult. Now, you cannot say, well, because I don't know what to do, I won't marry again. You can't say that. You still have to marry one of them. One of them. And you have to really find out which one is best suited to you. How is God going to do that? I will, I will teach all of that. Don't worry. I will teach all of that. I'm just going step by step. So, the two main patterns, when it is day, you obey. When it is night, you seek for light. When it is day, you obey. When it is night, you seek for light. And ask God to give you light. Now, I'm going to show you an example of something like that in the Bible. First Samuel chapter well, before we go to First Samuel, we'll go to Joshua chapter 1 verse 7 to 9. Joshua 1 7 to 9. It says well, I would read verse uh, 8. This book of the law shall not depart from a mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you'll make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success. Now, God is telling Joshua, the book of the law is there. It's clear. This is God's word. It tells you what to do, what not to do, what to eat, what not to eat, all of that. It's clear. It's daylight. He didn't say, seek for my wisdom or my guidance, whether you should obey the book of the law or not. He says, you meditate on it, you speak about it, and you observe to do it, all that is written in it. When God's word is clear, you do it. But let me show you an example of when God's word is not clear. First Samuel chapter 30. First Samuel chapter 30 from verse 6 to 8. This is David. He is in trouble because he goes out, comes back, and his base has been ransacked and his family and property all taken and his team wants to stone him first Samuel chapter 30 verse 6 to 8 says now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and his daughters but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God now you know one thing about the Jews when they say they want to stone you, you have to take it seriously. Because they are very experienced stoners. These guys know how to stone. I mean, they, they've been practicing it for a long time. So when they told David, we want to stone you, he knew this is serious. These guys know how to stone people. So they want to stone him. Why? Because he's their leader. And when there's trouble, everybody blames the leader. So they, they, they're distressed because not only has David lost his family, but everybody has lost his family. But the Bible says David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Verse 7, I want you to note carefully. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, bring the effort here to me. And Abiathar brought the effort to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, 
pursue for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all now david comes upon this crisis he cannot go to any scripture to find out whether he should fight or not there's there's no scripture verse that says go after the philistines or the go after malachites or go go and you can't find that you can't find it so now he has to be sure of what to do so he does something very interesting and i will teach a little bit on that later he doesn't have a clear word from god so he needs to hear from god under the old testament there were two major ways that people were to hear from god through the priest and through the prophet through the priest and through the prophet when they went to the priest the priest used the effort the effort was a garment that the priest used the high priest used in the front of the f effort there were all kinds of jewels here but there were two particular symbols in the effort of the priest called the urim and the tumim the urim and the tumim strange names but we can't challenge god urim and tumim now the urim and tumim were used by the priest to discern the will of god and normally the urim and the tumim will answer yes or no should i do it yes should i not do it no that is just yes or no yes or no so you ask yes or no yes or no yes or no until you get the right answer so the priest is the one who is entitled to use the effort and the urim and the tumim and then the second is a prophet i'm not going to touch that today so david speaks to abiathar the priest watch what he's doing he doesn't tell abiathar consult god for me he tells abiathar bring me the effort and the priest hands over the effort to david david is not a priest but david is now operating at a higher level not just as an ordinary congregation member david says i'm going to use the same system the priest uses to discern the will of god i want to control that process because i need to know the will of god for myself so he asks for the urim and the tumim the effort and the abiata hands over the effort to david now one thing about david david was in the old testament but he operated in the new testament you remember when he went to to uh to eat the bread that only priests are supposed to eat he, he just he ate it and he didn't die david knew how to access the future in the present he knew how to enter into the presence of god by a new and living way although he was in the old testament the problem is a lot of us in the new testament are trying to seek god by the old testament method when david in the old testament is seeking god by the new testament method so they bring him the urine and the tumin and he begins to question should i go after this troop the people who came to steal my property should i go after them and if i go will i win two very important questions should i go will i win now they are not one and the same question should i go is not the same as will i win now there are many people who seek god and never seek clarity for his will so they hear a word they pray and they feel oh god says i should go did he say you'll win did he say you'll win so you go and get beaten and then you say god has failed me god has disappointed he said i will i should go i'll win but he said you should go did you ask will i win david is a man of detail and clarity should i go will i win 
God says, go, pursue, overtake, and you will recover everything. I remember the story, and this is a true story, uh, in Ghana. This happened in the 70s sometime. And the, 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 the bunch of uh, Scripture Union Christians, young student Christians, praying. They're going to take the O-level, A-level, advanced level. And they're praying, 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 praying that, you know, go for prayer meetings, go for evangelism, as Christians normally do, as sometimes at the expense of learning. So just winning souls and, 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 and so on. So one, one, one of those times when they were praying, they received a prophecy, a prophecy that they would all go to the university. Now, these are six formers getting to university, all go to university. So they go to sit for the A level, and some of them passed and some failed. And the ones who failed says, God has disappointed us. He said we will pass, but he didn't say you will pass. He said you will go to the university. And he didn't say this year. And he didn't, so, so the moment they had, they'll go to university, they assume they will pass their exam. And they assume it will happen this year. I know the people because all of them eventually sat for the A-level twice, three times, four times. But they managed to go to the university. Has God's word been fulfilled? Yes. Now they would have saved themselves a lot of trouble if they had done what David did. Should I go? Will I win? Will I go to university this year? Don't assume that your will is the will of God. Don't assume that your wishes are the will of God. Don't assume that just because something is important to you, it's important to God. Don't assume that God sees things the way you see it. Because sometimes God leads us in ways that do not make sense. It takes time. If you study the Bible, you see so many examples. I mean, you take somebody like Daniel. Daniel was taken as a captive from Judah to Babylon. Do you think he was praying when the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar attacked his country? Was he praying that his nation will win the battle? I'm sure he was praying. God, please deliver us. God, please deliver us. God, save us. God, and quoting all the Abrahamic promises. And yet, Judah lost the battle. Daniel is taken into captivity. When he's taken into captivity, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, decides that he should be an eunuch. And I'm sure Daniel is praying against, I don't want to be a eunuch. I want to have a child. I don't want to have a eunuch. I don't want to God do something. God save me. God save me. He's made a eunuch. So you say, what's happening? The guy is praying and it's not happening. You see, many times we think God responds to our prayer. God doesn't respond to your prayer. He responds to his will. He responds to his will. The, the, when he answers your prayer, when your prayer aligns with his will. Jesus says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not our will be done on earth as we want. So Daniel goes through all of that. It seems as if all his prayers are not answered. And then you look at the next trajectory of his life. And he encounters Nebuchadnezzar. The supreme power of the earth at that time. And Nebuchadnezzar eventually says, God rules in the affairs of men. And there is no God like the God of Daniel. And, and he begins to have profound influence over Nebuchadnezzar, over, over uh, Belshazzar, over Darius over Cyrus four kings 70 years of influence 
see some of the most profound visions anybody has ever seen, he would never have been exposed to that level of political power. And his visions were not, oh, somebody is sitting here and uh, you ate uh, beef before you came to church. <laughs> Whatever value that serves, I don't know. But Daniel is talking about kingdoms, the unfolding of kingdoms. We are actually now seeing some of his vision become a reality. But when it started, it seemed as if God never answered his prayer. Because many times we are praying self-interest. God is looking at the big picture. And he will guide your steps to the big picture. Even if you don't understand it, he's going to bring you to the big picture. Sometimes you have to fail in order for you to succeed. Sometimes you have to fail. He says to Abraham, when Abraham is in a trance, he says, know of a certainty that the nation that will come after you will be slaves. Have, has the nation been born? No. Have they committed any sin? No. Is it a punishment? No. He says, just no. They can, you can reject it. You can refuse it. You can fast 100 days. You, they will be slaves. They will be slaves. There is a part of my plan for them that includes slavery. <laughs> then he says afterward I will bring them out with great wealth so you have to understand when we are dealing with knowing the will of God is not knowing your will that is why it's so important it is knowing the will of God not your will we all know your will I know my will if, if it was my will alone oh God of mercy I'll be living in Buckingham Palace by this time. Isn't it nice? I mean, those chariots are nice. Riding in them is not bad at all. But I wasn't born. There. You know, I mean, I was just born, I, I, and, and my mother was not a queen. I, I, are you understanding? I mean, did I do anything wrong? No. Charles woke up one day, he realized, ah, my mother is a queen. Did he do anything right? No. It just happens. You just woke up, you realize, whew, I'm born into money. And then some people wake up and say, whew. <laughs> Where I was born is a different story. But there will be an afterward. Somebody said there will be an afterward. Afterward, now, now, so, so you, you don't say, I'm Daniel, I've prayed that I will not be captive, and I became captive. I pray I will not be castrated, I've been castrated, so now God doesn't exist. No, wait, because there is an afterward. There is an afterward. There is an afterward, and when you come into God's afterward, that is when you can say, All things make sense. All things work together for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. His purpose is what makes all things work together for our good. So, David understands that. Should I go? God says, yes. Will I overcome? He says, yes. He tells the people, let's go. And they go, and it happens as it is. But the point that I want you to note is how David received that direction. He didn't get it by consulting the priest for direction. He got it by taking hold of what the priest has for himself so that he can discern the will of God himself. If there is anything I want every Christian to do is to get to the point where you take the effort from the man of God and you seek God's will yourself. 
That is the New Testament way. Now, how can we be sure? Or what, what kind of environment should we create if we want to know the will of God so that we can be clear about the will of God? There are a few things you have to get done. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 12 to 13. Talking about how Israel was led, it says, So the Lord alone led him. The Lord alone led him, and there was no foreign God with him. The Lord alone led him, and there was no foreign God with him. The Lord alone led him. And there was no foreign God with him. If you want to be led by God, these are the two important things you must certify. If you say, I really want to know the will of God, then you have to determine the Lord alone is going to lead me. And there will be no foreign God. You cannot be led by God when you are looking to something else to lead you. You cannot be led by God when he is just a spare tie of leadership for you. It's almost like you're saying, even if I don't hear from God, I will hear from here. The Lord alone led him and there was no foreign God with him. Complete separation from idolatry. Complete rejection of demonic divination. Now, for people in Western societies, not you. You, you were transplanted here. But you know, people who have grown up in the European world, ancestrally, uh, five, six generations rooted in Europe. Um, they have inherited a Christian culture without even knowing they've inherited it. It's a Christian culture that totally dealt with the traditional practices in this part of the world with the Druids and all kinds of magicians and, and so on. Christianity uprooted it. So the average European thinks that he's civilized. But really, it's a culture that was Christianized. And because of that, there are certain things that they went away from. Now they are embracing those things back. They are welcoming them. But for us Africans, Christianity has been with us, but it is not deep. So... The African Christian loves Jesus and loves other things. Let's face it. If we are to go for inspection of what you are wearing underneath your clothes and some things you have in your home right in this country, You'll be amazed. The talismans, the amulets, the all kinds of things that people are hiding in their pocket, around their neck, in their, on their waist. And, and, and they come to worship. But they also believe that, you know, we have to take care of this one too. Because, you know, the world is a dangerous place. <laughs> you know, and, you know, you, you, you have to do all. It's like the average African politician. They will come to church and say, praise the Lord, and go everywhere and say whatever they have to say. They accept everything. I was talking to a politician. He says, Pastor, you have to accept everything because the world is strange. So you have to receive all. And they feel that the more of those things they have, the more protected they are. But if you want Yahweh to guide you, 
then you have to make a decision. He alone is my guide and there is no foreign God. That is the ground rule. There are people who are seeking for God's guidance. There are people who go to a prophet and say, prophet, tell me what uh, God is saying. And the next day they'll go to an enchanter to seek the will of whatever. Because for them, make use of everything that is available. But if you want God to lead you, the first quality decision you have to make, that he is going to be the only one and there will be no foreign God. And you're going to break with every practice that seek guidance. Now I'm going to walk you through some of the things that we have to break in order to guarantee that God alone is a source of our guidance. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse, from verse 9, God says to the children of Israel, he says, Deuteronomy 18, verse 9, it says, When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, a sorcerer, one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. The dead. I like how the, this is from the New King James. I like how the Old King James uh, renders that passage. And, and this is how the Old King James Version says. It says, There shall not be found among you anyone who maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Seven of them. Eight, actually. So I'll go through each one of them quickly. The first is divination. Divination is consulting an oracle to predict the future. So you go to an oracle, one way or the other, and it tells you what is going to happen. That's divination. Observer of times. Observer of times is one who moves or lives his life based on lucky days and unlucky days. So, for example, you're going to start a business. And somebody comes and says, well, the 14th of July is not your lucky day. You have to move it to 18th. Now, if he says that and still says, that says the Lord, believe you me, it is called an observer of times. Because what has happened among Christians is there are people who do these things but camouflage it with the name of the Lord. Anyone who tells you that an activity of yours must fall on a lucky day is not of God. It's not of God. No matter what he calls him, no matter the accolade, no matter how high he goes, it's not of God. It's called observer of times. Somebody tells you, Wednesday is your lucky day. Or Fridays are your lucky days. There are some of you, on particular days, Africans, you wear white. Because you believe it's your lucky day. And you believe today, when I, oh, today I'll be lucky. An observer of times. Observer of times goes into astrology. Some of you actually believe your character represents that of your horoscope. I, I hear believers who say, I'm a Sagittarius. And we Sagittarius, is it Sagittarius? <laughs> that is how we are. I am a Capricorn. And th this is how we are. Look, read it, read it. This is exactly me. This is how I am. It's called observer of times. When you do that, you are bringing yourself under demonic activity. And that demonic activity is going to block the flow of God speaking to you and God leading you. An observer of times. When we follow Christ, we don't observe times. 
We don't observe new moons. We don't, we don't play those games. It's not Christianity. Then enchanter. Enchanter is somebody who predicts, interprets omens and tokens. And these are people who tell you the future by reading cards, reading your palm, reading the flight of birds. In ancient Rome and Greece, they had the ogres who interpret the birds fly this way. They said so and so will happen, that will happen. And there are people now who read palms supposedly and read cards and read the intestines of animals and so on. These are enchanters. If you want to be led by God, you don't get close to these things. If you get there, you are contaminating the process. That is why a lot of people pray, God speak to me. He can't speak to you because he's not your source of direction. Witchcraft. Now the witchcraft here is not the West African variety. Another word for this witchcraft is sorcerer. It's somebody who does magical works. This word is used in, the, in Exodus chapter 7, uh, verse 11, to describe the magicians of Pharaoh's court. They were sorcerers. They were practicing witchcraft. Now, how were they operating? They could change physical objects. You remember when Moses turned the Nile into blood, they went to another part and also turned it into blood. When Moses' uh, staff turned to snake, they also created it. Was it real? Yes. That... That uh, snake was not a hologram. That was a proper snake. Proper snake. Was it physical? Yes. So does it mean that there are people who can make physical things happen to you? You go to somebody and he says, I will pray and there will be money in your pocket. Sorcery. Magic. I would collect your passport from the air. Magic. That's magic. Now, sometimes people will see that and say, but it's powerful. I saw it with my own two eyes. Yes. The snakes you, you, you see with your own two eyes. But one of God, the other not of God. In any case, in the New Testament, that doesn't happen. And Tomorrow I will show you how Jesus operated and how the apostles operated and how we can truly discern the will of God. You have to deal with magic. Get it out of your system. If you saw the work of a sorcerer, you may be tempted to call it a miracle. You'll be tempted. Believe you me, there are prominent people masquerading as men of God who are just sorcerers. Do, does thing, do things happen? Yes. How do you judge whether this is of God, that is not of God? Jesus gave us just one way, by their fruits. Not by their miracles. By their character. So the man is sleeping with everybody's wife in his group and is sleeping with all the girls, but he's still working miracles. Something is doing something. <laughs> it cannot be the same Yahweh and the same Jesus doing it when he says don't. He cannot approve it. He can't. And some of these things are becoming so polished that a lot of believers are being led astray. 
out of desperation because we don't know how to design the will of God. We are going to all kinds of places for help, for prayer. This one says that, that one says that. This one is powerful, that one is powerful, this one is powerful. Hey, I'm telling you the things my eyes have seen, you know, the way Africans, we, we, hey, the way, hey, the things my eyes have seen. Hey, 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 hey. My own eyes, my own eyes, I saw it. Yeah, the snake, you will see it with your own eyes. It was sorcery. If you read the Bible, Simon the sorcerer was working miracles. Was working miracles. Be careful what you call a miracle. Witchcraft. Number five, a charmer. A charmer is one who casts spells or binds elements to people. It is a kind of practice where somebody binds things to you. He casts a spell. He blows on something and something hits you. That's the work of a charmer. Now, listen to me. If you go to any man of God, supposedly, you say, pastor, prophet, man of God, apostle, bishop, senior bishop, whatever. This is my problem. I love that man. I want to marry him. And the man loves me. He also wants to marry me. But Sister Konitu likes the man. So I want you to do work on her for me. And then the man says, don't worry. I will pray. And we will neutralize her. That prayer, it is a charm. Because what the person is going to do is going to deploy spiritual forces to disable another person so that you can get along. That's not how God operates. Or somebody says, I'm going to pray that somebody's business goes down so yours will go up. That's not how it happens. It's charms. It's charms. And if you are seeking God's guidance through any of these things, you can't hear from God. A charmer sometimes makes people fall in love with people they don't love. When I was growing up, they used to call something for girls. I don't know whether it worked or not, you know. Because every African child has, you know, you double in these things. We used to play soccer as kids. And when we're going to play soccer, we'll catch a grasshopper and then stick some brooms into the grasshopper, tie the grasshopper. If you stick three broom sticks, then you're going to score three goals tied and go and put it in the goalpost of your opponent. It's, that's, that's what they are talking about. I mean, it's kid stuff, but... Because the adults were doing it, so we were doing the kid variety of it. <laughs> but that is charming. That is charming. Somebody gives you a potion and says, drink this. Drink this. And when you go for the interview, everybody you see, they will like you. That's a charm. That's a charm. You see, Christianity is not about tokens. And objects. Christianity is about faith in God through Christ. Nothing else. You don't put a leaf on your tongue to go and talk to people. You don't have a white handkerchief that you, you wipe your face with so you charm people who are interviewing for a job. That's not Christianity. Consultant with familiar spirits. This one is a very big one. Consultant with familiar spirits is contacting, imitating spirits. What is a familiar spirit? 
A familiar spirit is a spirit that knows a person and can mimic him or her in appearance, thoughts, and language. A familiar spirit, by the name, is a demon that is familiar with you. Knows you, studies you. Studies the way you dress, studies the way you talk. And manifest. So that familiar spirit can enter somebody. You know, sometimes these days I hear things that happen in Christendom, I get amazed. People go for meetings and they say, your grandmother is talking. Your grandmother is talking. Has entered somebody and is talking. And people believe it's God. It's familiar spirit. Familiar spirit. Familiar spirit is familiar with you. Can tell you things that nobody else knows. Except you. Can reveal your secrets. Now if you go to somebody who operates with a familiar spirit, that demon is going to give you information about you to that person. And the person will tell you accurate things about you. Is it accurate? Yes. What spirit? Check it. How do I check? The character. The character. Not the power, the character. The guy is stealing everybody's money. He's beating his wife. Unfaithful to his wife. Sleeping with all the choir. And still giving word of knowledge. What kind of Holy Ghost is that? <laughs> I mean, what kind of Holy Ghost is that? Then a wizard. A wizard is an expert in spiritual operations. I don't want to talk too much about it. A necromancer. One who deals with dead people. Pretending to raise ghosts through various incantations, magical ceremonies. Most people resort to these kinds of guidance when they are in a crisis. When they are in a crisis. I'm going to show you quickly. First Samuel chapter 28 verse, from verse 3. It says, now Samuel had died and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah. In his own city. Saul had put the mediums and spirits out of the land. The Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together. They encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. Either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. I'll talk about that next tomorrow. Before we pray tomorrow. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. I, I like what the old King James says. He says, Then Saul said unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself, put on other raiment. He went, two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. Be careful the advices you have around you. Saul has put away all the mediums, the familiar spirit people, out of Israel. Now he talks to his chief of staff and says, listen, I'm in a crisis. God is not speaking to me. I need a witch. Somebody with a familiar spirit. And they say, sir, we know exactly where one is. He's at Endor. So how did they know? How, did, how could they come with such a quick answer? I mean, they, could, they should have said, Oh, Seb, you've killed all of them, you've sacked all of them, so we have to go and research and see if there's one left. They immediately. <laughs> they said, Oh, we know one. Be careful, people who give you instant answers of where to go. Oh, I'm, I'm in trouble. I need somebody to help. Oh, I know somebody. I know somebody. He's there. Be careful. They knew a witch. 
in Endor, not even somewhere we'll go and find. In Endor, this. <laughs> so it means they've been going there. They are, they are, they are customers, clients. Now, remember what has happened. Saul is not in fellowship with God. He's lost access to Samuel. He's facing a crucial battle. And he's looking for any help. And the woman calls forth a form. And the Bible says, And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. And he said to her, What is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up and he's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped in his face with his face to the ground and bowed down. This has been one of the most troubling scriptures. Was this Samuel? Did that witch call forth Samuel? How could she call forth Samuel? For her to call forth Samuel, she has to evade paradise go to Abraham's bosom claim Samuel and bring him in the story of Lazarus and the rich man Jesus says that the distance you can't cross it so could she cross no that wasn't Samuel so how do you know it wasn't Samuel because he was in a mantle Samuel had died, he had been buried. If you die, you are buried, you are buried naked. Your clothes will perish with you. When you are coming up, you shouldn't have anything around you. If it's Samuel, then you shouldn't have anything around him. But it's a mantle. What is happening is a familiar spirit, a mimicking spirit. It's a mimicking spirit. It is mimicking, it is doing everything as Samuel is, looks like Samuel, talks like Samuel, and even speaks as Samuel will speak. And she, he gives information, that supposed Samuel, and says, Saul, you will die at the battle. Saul died. Was he accurate? Yes. Was that spirit accurate? Yes. Did it come from God? No. So accuracy is not a guarantee that what you are hearing is of God. It's accurate. It's a clear word. You, somebody who's, you know, if it was one, some of us, we say, hey, 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 Pastor, I'm telling you. Be, 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 be. Hey. Goose pimples. Look at Pastor, look at me. As I'm talking to you, there are goose pimples all over me. There are goose pimples. Hey, goosebumps. Pastor, I haven't seen anything like that. The man is accurate. Be, 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 be. A witch in endo. <laughs> a witch in endo. A witch, a wizard. So it's not Samuel. But the information is accurate. Just like the magicians work some things that are quite real. The source is not of God. If you want to hear from God, you have to take away all the foreign gods. And you have to say, you alone. It is when you make that quality decision, come high water, come deep water, no matter what, I'm in the biggest crisis of my life. I'm about to die, but I'm going to seek God alone. I am sick. I need a miracle. I need healing. This thing can kill me, but I will seek God alone. Until you make that quality decision, God will not show forth his arm in your life. And you cannot hear him clearly. So all you do is depend on other people to hear him for you. Tonight, we want to make that commitment to God alone. No games. Trust in him. That he knows the future. He knows how to speak to me. And listen, tomorrow I'm going to touch on this. 
if you are a child of God in the New Testament, God will not bypass you to go and tell your business to somebody for the person to come and tell you. You are his child. You are a child of God. And I'm going to show you that in the New Testament tomorrow. I'm going to show that to you. But let me end with David again, and then we close. The reason Saul went to the witch is because he's in a crisis. But look at how David also responds when he's in a crisis. First Samuel chapter 23, verse 1 and 2. Then they told David, saying, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Kila, and they are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? The Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Kila. First Samuel chapter 30. Well, we read, we read that already. We spoke to Abiathar. First, second Samuel chapter 2 verse 1. It happened after this that David inquired the Lord saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. And David said, Where shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. Now this is after Saul is dead. Everybody wants David to be king. David doesn't get up to say, I'm going to go. In, at every junction, he's seeking the Lord. He's seeking the Lord. Second Samuel chapter 5, verse 17 to 20. And when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went up to the stronghold. The Philistines also went up and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines in your hand. Now you find in all these instances he has two questions should i go will i succeed should i go will i succeed always follow up question david didn't presume for god and in every crisis whether he had to ascend to the throne whether he had to go and fight a battle whether the enemy was come against him he always sought the lord when saul is in trouble he's seeking witches david is in trouble he's seeking the lord no wonder god says I have found in David a man after my heart. Now, when God says, I found in David a man after my heart, it doesn't mean David is perfect. He says, I found a, in David a man who seeks my heart. A man who seeks my heart. A man who wants to know what I, 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 I'm looking for, what my will is. And he's not going to outsource that to the priest. He takes charge of it. To seek the Lord. If you want to hear from God, don't outsource the voice of God to anybody. Not to me. Sometimes people come to me and say, Pastor, what is God saying about me to you? Are you, are you God's nephew? <laughs> are you his nephew? <laughs> How come he can speak to me and he not, cannot speak to you? Are you his child? Is he your father? Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. He says, a, he says, a stranger's voice they will not hear. But we are going to strangers. My sheep hear my voice. And the reason why it's been difficult for a lot of believers to hear from God is because first, they're worshiping God, but they have so many other things they are seeking after. Tonight, we're going to pray. And you're going to denounce every other God. Every other source of guidance you have used, you're going to separate yourself from it. And you're going to make a promise with God tonight and say, Lord, it's you alone. It's you alone. And tomorrow night, as we pray, we're going to believe God that from tomorrow night, the power of God will start operating in your life so clearly that the voice of God and his will will become so easy to discern. Because the path is clear for God to speak to you, for God to make himself known to you. He will, he will show himself to you. He will reveal himself to you. But for that to happen, we have to say, only God. Are you ready to say that? 
Are you ready to pray and say, Holy God? Let's rise up, everybody. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lift up your hands to God and begin to dedicate yourself to Him and, and say, Lord, I'm all yours. I'm yours 100%. You are my God. You alone are my God. There is no other God besides you. Just dedicate, say, Lord, I dedicate myself to you, my mind, my spirit, my thoughts, my ideas. I dedicate to you. Begin to talk to God. Dedicate yourself to him. We'll serve no foreign God, no foreign God, no enchantment, no divination. We pledge tonight that Jehovah, the God of Abraham, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible, is our God. And he alone, he alone, he alone is our God. If you really want to break free tonight, you will be free. Some of you will have to go home tonight and discard things that you hold on to. Things that have been given to you. Things you have eaten. Things you hide. Things you keep. Things you make sacrifices to. If you want God to be your God, you have to denounce them. Say with me, in the name of Jesus, tonight, I separate myself, my spirit, my soul, my mind, my thoughts, from every foreign God, from every demonic activity, Every satanic enterprise, every divination, enchantment, sorcery, I separate myself from it. In the name of Jesus, I am free. I am free from every sorcery in my family, in my bloodline. I am free from every divination in my family, in my bloodline. From today, I speak the blood of Jesus over my life. Set me free. 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 Every fear of the enemy that has paralyzed you, words that have been spoken against you, Fearful images you have seen that terrify you from today. I break the power of Satan. I break every demonic activity out of your life. I command him out of your life. I command him out of your business. I command him out of your family. In the name of Jesus. Sometimes we get caught because it's a legacy. It's a legacy. A family legacy. And you may not even subscribe fully to it, but you see that something about that legacy puts fear in you. It puts fear in you. And, and you're, you're, one, one moment you trust God, another moment you're afraid. Fear has torment. You cannot... The Bible says perfect love casts off fear. When we are totally in love with God, there should be no fear of your family, of your ancestors, over every power, over every commitment they have made. Tonight is the night of liberation and of deliverance. And you are going to pray in the name of Jesus. The Bible says you shall bind the strong man. And you're going to say in the name of Jesus, I bind every spirit 
every force, every power that has operated in my family that interferes with the move of God in my life. I break it now in the name of Jesus. Let's pray, pray, pray. You will not live in fear. You will not live in fear. You will not live in worry. You will not live in any worry. In the name of Jesus, there will be no fear. There will be no fear. There will be no fear. Break the spirit of fear. Break the spirit of fear. Break the spirit of fear. Break it in the name of Jesus. Nothing from your family shall pursue you. Nothing from your past shall pursue you. Nothing from your ancestry shall pursue you. Nothing in your bloodline shall pursue you. In the name of Jesus. If you've ever submitted yourself, if you've ever submitted yourself to any of the things I spoke about, you submitted yourself to some divination, some sorcery, whatever it is, tonight you are going to name it, call it by name. And you are going to say, in the name of Jesus, I break your control over my life. Maybe somebody took you somewhere, and now you know it was witchcraft, or it was sorcery, or necromancy, or familiar spirit. You're going to say from today, call it by name, and speak the blood of Jesus, and cancel it out of your life. You have power to do that for yourself. You have power. Now begin to speak. Set yourself free. Set yourself free. If you've been reading the horoscope, astrology, palm reading, watching a psychic network, phoning in to psychics, Set yourself free from it. Deliver yourself from it. Claim the blood of Jesus over your life. The covering of the blood over your life. You are walking free from that thing in the name of Jesus. No interruption. No jamming of your frequency. No other voice counteracting the voice of God. You will hear no other voice except the voice of God. You will not hear the voice of familiar spirits. You will not hear the voice of demons. You will not hear the voice of devils. You will not hear the voice of spiritists. You will hear only the voice of God. No jamming of your frequency. No interruption with God's processes. Just open my ears, Lord. Open my eyes, Lord. Open my ears, Lord. Open my eyes, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that from tonight your people will have a sweet encounter with you from tonight sweet encounter visit them speak to them touch them let your voice be clear without interruption when you speak they would hear when you command they will obey Concerning every decision your children are making, I pray, Lord, that they'll find your voice. They'll find your will. They would know your will. They would not depend on somebody else, but you will speak to them by your Holy Spirit. Let tonight be the beginning of a deep encounter between you and your children of sweet fellowship with the Holy Spirit, of your presence surrounding them wherever they are, and let them know you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.